All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know everybody is short on time, and I certainly appreciate you joining us today. So let's go ahead and get started, get you on your, on your way. All right, thank you to everybody for joining us today. My name is John Mullins, and I'm coming to you from, from with Themis today. Uh, you should be able to see a slide up there on your screen. Um, information on there is very important. Uh, there's my email address. If you have any detailed questions uh, regarding any of the topics we talk about, feel free to send me an email at jmullins at themisinc.com. You can also get further information on uh, what Themis has to offer as well at themisinc.com. And then I uh, see some questions coming in in the question box over there. Uh, a couple things. The, the slides for today are, should already be available out on the website at themisinc.com slash webinars. And uh, either late today or tomorrow, there'll be a recording uh, out there as well. So the, the recorded session will be posted out there. It takes a little bit of time for it to get formatted and to get put out there. So that'll be out there either late tonight or tomorrow. We should have that out there for you. Okay. So yeah, go out to themisync.com slash webinars. You can get a copy of the you can get a copy of the slides out there. Uh, they're already out there. All right. A um, couple of other things, too. Um, you can also follow us at Twitter, at Themis Training. So uh, there's always uh, good announcements out there of upcoming seminars, uh, training sessions, and things like that as well. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump right in here. Um, I know we're kind of short on, on time as far as having about 45 minutes for today's seminar here, so we're going to try to pack in here as much as we can. Um, notice the topic um, is 20 Essential SQL and PL SQL Tuning Tips. You know, probably the most difficult thing about putting together today's webinar, it was just trying to narrow down the tips and things we wanted to talk about to just 20. I mean, there are so many things to talk about, as many of you know, when it comes to tuning. Um, we used a very strong word there, essential. These are some of the ones that, uh, the, that I feel are, are very important. Uh, some of these will be very simple, and you'll already be aware of them. Some of them will be a little bit more complex that maybe you're not currently um, using in your environment, but maybe they could provide some benefit to you when it comes to performance of your SQL or PL SQL code. All right, so let's jump right in here. Again, if you have any questions along the way, um, you can put those up in the question box. I'll try to to get to those, but the best way will be go ahead and take down my, my email address here. Um, with the time that we have, the best way is for me just to address those questions after the session and send you back an email. So at jmullins at themasync.com. All right, just a little bit of information about myself. I'm, 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 I've seen some of the people that have registered for the for the webinar today, so I recognize many of the names out there from some of the classes that we've uh, had in the past. So it's good to um, see you all again. Um, again, my name is John Mullins. I've been many of you know I've been working with Oracle since the '80s, um, kind of the early to mid '80s. I started with Oracle version 5.122. You know, version 5, there wasn't much we could do in version 5 as far as performance tuning goes. And then a lot of, of course, a lot of the other features weren't in there either. So I started with version 5.122 on a DEC Ultrix operating system when I worked at Boeing. I worked at Boeing for 10 years as a developer, DBA uh, type person. Um, and since then, I've worked for various consulting companies and training companies. I am a, an OCP uh, DBA. Uh, as many of you know from the classes there, and I'm also a certified technical trainer, so I do try to keep things fairly structured, but we also want to kind of kick back and kind of enjoy the topic that we're talking about. Um, over the years, since those 80s, there's been over 300 classes that I've taught along the way, and I also currently do, also do uh, short-term consulting as well, so for tuning, troubleshooting, installations, upgrades, uh, those types of things. 
if you're not familiar with uh, Themis at all, you can always go out to themisinc.com, see a little bit of more information out there as well. Um, been around a long time, provide training in a whole bunch of different areas out there. So in addition to Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, operating system type stuff with Unix and Linux, uh, web development stuff, Java, um, .NET, and all kinds of other topics out there too. So feel free to browse that website and get some further information about Themis. There are some classes that are related to the webinar we'll be talking about. I won't go into those in here because I know we're anxious to get started here, but uh, here they are. You can also see them out there on the website. But uh, you know, troubleshooting, debugging, tuning, PL SQL. We also have an Oracle, just SQL tuning class, and then a tuning class for just uh, DBA type people as well. All right, here's what we're going to be doing today. I got 20 basically tips or topics that are related to tuning that I think are, are, are pretty good and pretty important when it comes to the tuning environment. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Of course, with the time that we have, we're not going to be able to go into great detail on these, but I'm, I'm going to go try to go into as much detail as possible on these as well. All right, so let's jump right in here and let's take a look and see what we got. Let's go to our, our first topic here. All right, tuning tip one. What I try to do is kind of mix the SQL and PL SQL so that for those of you that are that are more SQL and not so much PL SQL or vice versa, I kind of kind of try to put them in here. Every other one is SQL or PL SQL, so you don't have to wait till the end. Like, oh, I'm really wanting to see some PL SQL stuff. You don't have to wait till the end for that. So I'm going to try to mix them up here um, along the way. All right, tuning tip number one, and these aren't necessarily in any particular order as far as, oh, number one is by far the most important thing that you should ever do when it comes to tuning or try to take advantage of to speed up your stuff, so they're not in any particular order. Uh, number one is an SQL type tip. Uh, take advantage of the result cache feature. Okay, um, as I teach a lot of the classes out there or do some consulting, a lot of people aren't aware of the result cache. It's been around since Oracle 11G, so it's been around for you know, a fair number of years. Um, not very many versions, but 11G has been out there for quite some time. Result cache is kind of like a materialized view, and, and a lot of people are familiar with materialized views. Um, so when I mention that, they're like, oh, I know what that is. We use those all the time. but Here's where they kind of come into play. Result cache is a memory structure. Um, it's it out there. It stores results of queries in memory. You know, typically in Oracle, by default, the, the raw data that your queries are accessing, um, the raw data is stored in memory in something called the buffer cache. And so Oracle likes to try to put by default everything up in memory. Um, for you that you're trying to access, but he doesn't store by default the results of that. So if you're doing things like aggregate functions or executing your own functions and your code is reading a lot of data but producing a fairly small result set, like I want the average price of all my orders or something like that, or I want the average attendance of all my polling stations that I have out there, um, a lot of times the... Uh, we read a lot of data, but the result set might be small. In fact, it might only be one record um, that's out there. Okay, so um, that's where this could come into play. So what we want to kind of see here is that if you are doing those types of things, we can actually then store the result in memory in the result cache. And there's a couple of different ways to do that, and I'll show you a couple of different ways here in just a second. Um, a couple of the rules that are about it. We know that with materialized views, we can define how often the materialized view is refreshed. With the result cache, we don't have that benefit. All right, the the results that are in the result cache, those are going to get refreshed whenever um, the data that went into that result actually changes. Okay. You'll see a lot, of, a lot of features in Oracle over the years where Oracle will say, well, this feature is kind of targeted towards a certain type of environment. Is it an online transaction environment? Is it a data warehouse environment, data mart, decision support? What kind of environment is it? And those environments typically have some characteristics. You know, you know, transaction environment has lots of inserts, updates, and deletes, some reading going on as well, reporting, whatever. 
um, data warehouse, lots of reading, lots of reporting, lots of um, aggregation of data, summarization, calculations, uh, things like that that we're using to help us make certain decisions based on our business. But we don't change the data a lot. You know, data warehouse data gets refreshed. You know, it varies from one place to another, but gets refreshed. It might be once a night. It might be an incremental refresh. It might be a full refresh. Um, it might get refreshed during the day, once an hour, twice a day, once a week. But it's not just hitting the database just constantly, boom, 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 um, with changes that are there. So this result cache is going to be good for that kind of environment where the changes aren't that frequent. And you can kind of define what that frequent is because to, to some people, if, even if we're only changing the data maybe once every five or ten minutes, what we have to ask is the query and its results that we want to put in the result cache, how often is it run from the various parts of the application, from the various uh, ad hoc people that might be on the system? that are out there. You know, if even if I'm refreshing, even if I'm changing the data once every five minutes, if I have 10,000 concurrent users and this particular result that I want to store is, a, is accessed, you know, a thousand times in five minutes or a hundred times or even ten times in five minutes, then I can still see a benefit from this. Okay. All right, now the last bullet there also says that for UPL SQL people out there, and that's going to see our, be our tip number two, you can also write your own PL SQL functions that we label as result cache functions. And we'll talk about that in tip two here in just a moment. All right, so how, can, how does this thing get turned on? How is it enabled? How can I take advantage of this type of thing? Remember, what we're trying to do here is you read a lot of data, but you produce a small result set. It might be an aggregate function like an average account, a max, a min, whatever, or your own function. It doesn't have to be an aggregate. It could just be a regular query that returns 10 rows, typically. Um, the main benefit that we're getting out of this is reducing me memory reads. Okay, We're already assuming that we're not reading physically off of disk. And so we've got the raw data is stored up in memory on the database server. And a lot of people are like, well, that, that's as good as it gets, right? All the data is up in memory. But what if I could, instead of having to access 10 million records to show me the average price of all my orders, what if I only had to read one record that would show me the average price because the result is stored? So reading one record obviously is going to be faster than reading a million records. And if the average price of the orders doesn't change very often, then I can take a huge advantage of this um, particular feature. Now, how can it be implemented? The result cache memory structure is already there. So whether you're using it or not right now, it's already there. It's, it's part of what's called the shared pool. And the shared pool memory structure, that's where your information about your code is stored. So as you're running your SQL, your PL SQL, things like that, those are already stored in memory in the shared pool. Their execution plans are stored in the shared pool. They're, the code, the uh, definitions of tables and columns and constraints and privileges, those are all in the shared pool. And then you also have the result cache there. It's already there. Now, to take advantage of it, you have there's two, two main ways. One is the DBAs could turn it on system-wide for everybody. And so as you notice on this particular slide, there's a parameter called result cache mode. Okay, result cache mode. They can turn that on or off. Now, they're, I'm going to tell you right now, they're probably not likely to turn it on for everything. The result cache is a pretty small memory structure. Um, we can make it bigger or smaller. We can di dictate how big the result sets are that get stored there or not. If your result set doesn't fit in there, then your query runs just as it normally would. It would read the raw data, do the calculations, and produce the result, but you would not get any benefits unless the result is actually stored in the result cache. So they're probably not going to turn it on for everything, because what if I go out there right now and it's turned on for everything, and I'm running these queries that really aren't optimized very well, they're not very efficient, and I'm returning more records than I should, yet they still fit in the result cache? I might be filling up the result cache, causing other things to get thrown out or to get clobbered at that point. So they're probably not going to do that. But all is not lost. 
you can also use the result cache through hints. And you can see that on this slide here. Um, I'm going to turn on my little arrow here. So you can see here you have a couple of hints that you can take advantage of. One's called result cache, result underscore cache. One's called if it was turned on, you could say I don't want to use the result cache. And so, you know, many of you are familiar with using hints. Um, for most hints, we kind of treat them, and you'll see this as one of the tips in the presentation today, is kind of a last resort type of thing. Or, or if all else fails, let's try this hint at least temporarily to see if I can get the optimizer to choose a different, different plan. So we can just use a hint. So we do something like a slash asterisk plus. We say result cache, asterisk slash, and then here comes our query. Now the first time we run our query with the result cache hint, there's nothing in the result cache, right? Because we've never run it before. So what it'll do the very first time with the hint is it'll go out to the raw data, read all the data it needs to, do the calculations or get the results that it's supposed to, and then store the results in the result cache for future references to that query. Now that query, um, the next time I run it, the first thing Oracle's going to do is look in the result cache to see if the result for that particular query has already been stored and it's still valid. If it is, in other words, no changes have happened since the last time the query's been run, then I can get, read the result cache. Boom, here's the result. result. I might only have to read one record, and I, I, I bypass the buffer cache in reading those 10 million records that went into the result in the first place. Now, if the result is not in the result cache, even if I run it with the hint, or the, the result that's in there has been marked invalid because the raw data that went into it has changed, then it just runs like a normal query. It'll read the raw data, get the result. It'll store it in the result cache for the next time again, but I don't see any benefit for that. Okay. So that's how we can take advantage of that. So just use that hint there. You can do that. The way you can tell if you're using the result cache or not, for those of you that are familiar with using the explain plan utility, you know, run your query through the explain plan utility. It'll tell you in the output of the explain plan whether or not the result cache was used. Or if you're used to using like auto trace in SQL Developer or in SQL Plus, it'll also you'll be able to tell from there whether or not it used the result cache or not. Okay, so there's a couple ways we can tell that. Just like with materialized views, you can see huge benefits with this. So remember what we're looking for here is queries that access a lot of data that produce small amount of results, um, data that is not changing boom, boom, boom all the time, and we can use a hint to take advantage of this result cache. It's already there, right? We don't need to have go back and ask somebody, hey, can you install the result cache? Can you recreate the result cache memory structure? It's sitting there right now. It's probably empty on a lot of your systems. So right now, it's memory, and it's not being used. So we can also say that right now, we're kind of wasting some memory if we don't take advantage of it, if we have an environment, and if we have some queries that could take advantage of that. All right, remember, um, these slides are available out on our website, too. All right, tuning tip two. I'm just going to go through these. Like I said, if you remember my email address at the start, take down your questions, and I'll give you my email address again at jmullins at themasync.com. You can send me your questions as we go through here. Tip two is with PL SQL. It's related to tip one. You can write your own functions that are result cache enabled. Okay, so I put an example here on the screen. You already know what the benefits of a result cache are. So here when we do a create or replace function, I can add this uh, result cache option to my function code itself. Okay, so I can add that right here. I'm going to say result underscore cache. Okay. And then compile the function as you normally would, and then when you execute the function, it'll behave just like the SQL feature did. If uh, the result of this function, based on the input into this function, is already stored in the result cache, then I'll get it directly from there, and boom, here you got it. I don't have to go to the raw data to recalculate anything. Okay? So that's a good thing there. So it's very simple to implement, right? There's nothing else you need to do. Now, what this 
with when you do it with your own functions, notice this function has an input parameter. Uh, it's the department number. Okay, the results that are stored in the result cache are, are going to be based on the different inputs. So it, this one's doing what? The average salary for whatever department is input. So if I run it first for department 10, it'll store department 10's average salary in the result cache. If I run it later for department 20, and department 20 is not already there, it'll calculate the results, and then I'll have a result in the result cache for department 20. So in this case, I could have multiple results out there, one for each of the different or unique uh, inputs that I have to the function. Okay, very simple to implement there. You can see how to do that. I, I like that feature a lot. Um, lot. Sometimes we don't have the authority or privileges to create a materialized view. Um, you're not going to need any special privileges for this. There's nothing to create. You're just taking advantage of a memory structure that's already there. You're adding a hint to your code or if you already have the privileges to create a function, you're adding uh, just an option to it. All right, so I like that one. If you haven't, you know, if you haven't tried that one and you have queries that behave like that, try it. See what you get. All right, tip number three. And let's go through these. Like I said, some of these are going to be real short. Some of these will be a little bit longer. Um, I kind of put some of the longer ones at the front here. Tip three, gather extended statistics if necessary. Okay. Um, many of you are aware, and if you've taken some of my classes, the tuning classes before, we talk about object statistics all the time. And they're very important. When you issue a query, the optimizer goes out, he checks the statistics that are available, like how many records are in a table, how many distinct values are there for a particular column, if I'm referencing a certain column, and things like that. Um, and based on those statistics, will help the optimizer come up with a good execution plan. All right. Um, if those statistics are missing or inaccurate, that can be a problem. Okay. What we need to know, and where, that's where this feature comes in, and this is also an 11G new feature, these extended statistics, is that the statistics by default when they're generated, they're generated on individual objects, individual tables, individual columns, individual indexes, things like that. So one thing the optimizer does not know about is a relationship or a correlation between multiple columns. So in your WHERE clause, if you're checking on things where, where the job ID equals this and the department ID equals that, well, the correlation of the relationship there is that we have certain jobs within certain departments. For example, salespeople are in a certain department. I may not have salespeople sprinkled across all the departments. In another department, I have programmers. In another one, I have DBAs or managers. You know, managers might go across all the departments, for example. But the data could be skewed, in other words. You know, if I hit the right department, I'll get a lot of salespeople. If I hit the wrong department, I'll get zero uh, salespeople. But the optimizer doesn't know that. He only knows there's statistics on the job ID and there's statistics on the department ID. He will understand the skew or how the data is distributed within each one of those, but he doesn't know by default combinations of columns. And I'll show you how to create one of these extended statistics in a second. And this is a really good feature. So if he doesn't know the relationship or the correlation between two columns, like in this case job within department, he's just going to read the individual statistics and come up with an estimate on what he thinks the cardinality will be. Cardinality will be the estimated number of rows in the result. All right, And he has to do that based on the individual statistics, not the combined statistics which may cause him to come up with a bad cardinality, and if the cardinality is not a good estimate, then what does that do next? I can hear you all saying it. Then he comes up with potentially a bad execution plan. All right, now, how do I generate uh, some extended statistics here? I go over here to the next page. There we go. All right. There's a couple things I need to do. One is I need to create the definition of the extended statistics. So for you DBAs out there that are responsible for generating statistics or for the non-DBAs maybe in a non-production environment that maybe have that privilege, 
you can see it, it's, there's a, a function within the DBMS stats package called create extended stats. We're just going to give it the table name that we want it on and then put in the combination of the columns that we want the extended statistics to be on. So in addition to getting, like in our example here, in addition to getting statistics on job ID alone and department ID alone, even if we create histograms, they're going to be on, they'll show us the distribution of within each individual column, this way he's, all, he's going to basically create a histogram but for the combination of the columns so that he can tell that there are 20 salespeople in department 80 and he knows that there's zero salespeople in department 81. Otherwise, he, all he sees is that there's um, one job code called sales or how many different job codes are there. There might be 10 different job codes in 10 different departments and he's using the individual statistics for that. So step one is create the extended statistics. You only have to do that one time. What that says is from that point forward, anytime statistics are generated for the, the, in this case, the table that involves these columns, Oracle will go out and generate or gather additional statistics on the combination of those columns. Now there's a couple ways that that can happen. I put one of those up here on the screen for you. We can run the gather table stats uh, stored procedure and we can do it as if we're trying to create a histogram here. That's what it looks like on these two columns, column one and column two. If we do that, the extended statistics are stored in the database immediately. Now, you'll see if you go out there to Google and you Google this particular feature, you'll see some a lot of other examples out there where when they do the gather table stats, they only do it for a particular table and they don't do the histogram part. Um, that'll work, but here's, it's kind of quirky and it won't work the first time. It only worked the second time that the query is actually executed. So it'll go out there, generate statistics for it, but the, the first time you run the query, those extended statistics won't be used, but the optimizer will recognize that they're out there, and so that when you run it the next time, he says, hey, here's a better way to do it. So you might as well just go out when you generate the, the table stats, if you're going to do these extended statistics, go ahead and create a histogram on those two columns just like I have here. All right, and again, that can have uh, a huge... Um, difference in performance as well. I've, I've run some queries where if I look at the estimated cardinality in the explain plan output, the number's way off because I've got multiple columns. Even if you have multiple column indexes, that doesn't matter unless you have these extended statistics. So if you're having, if you run your queries and you, you see a cardinality that's way off, it might be because of this particular reason here and you just need to generate the extended statistics and then you'll be fine. Your cardinality estimates will be now be accurate, which gives the optimizer what it wants and needs to generate good execution plans. I see I, see I had a, one question over there in the uh, question box. Um, a couple questions there, back to the tip number one and two. Yeah, the default value for that parameter on the result cache is manual. That's what, what that means is you just use the hint to override that. And then the second question was the result cache option, um, the answer it is, is not, not available for stored procedures, only for functions. All right, so our next tip there was extended statistics. That's a good one, I think. All right, uh, tip number four, uh, PL SQL tip, take advantage of bulk pr processing features where appropriate. All right, and many of you are familiar with this. this. This feature has been gaining a lot of traction the last year or year and a half. You know, two years ago, I'd go out to do some consulting or do some training, and people, people never heard of this type of feature. It's been around for a long time, um, but lately people, people are starting to become aware of it, they're starting to use it, and they're starting to see the benefits of it. Here's the problem we run into in a PL SQL program. It doesn't matter what type it is. When the PL SQL program is running, when he runs across an SQL statement, the PL SQL engine does not understand the SQL engine, the SQL statement itself. So he has to pass that statement over to the SQL engine and say, hey, you execute this, and when you're done, just pass me back the results. And that's called a context switch. The more context switches that you have in your program, 
Um, the more context switches you have, the slower your code's going to be. It's just like I'm, I'm talking to somebody and we speak two different languages and we have to have an interpreter between us. You know, if we could just talk directly to each other, that goes pretty quickly, but I have to stop. The interpreter has to understand what I'm saying. The interpreter has to think about, okay, how do I say this in some other language? And then has to say that to the other person. And the other person has to respond in their language back to the interpreter and back to me. And that's kind of what a context switch is there. All right. All right, did we miss tip three? Sometimes my, let me go back here. Make sure, I'll finish tip four here and I'll take a look there. At tip three there. All right, so the way that we get around those context switches is we try to do things in bulk. In other words, instead of sending, executing a SQL statement one, one at a time, especially if it's inside a loop, we can gather it all up and we're going to store these in arrays and then send it to the database engine one in just one big bulk operation. So you can notice here on the screen, um, I have two really good examples on how to do that. All right, first one here is the select. And so we're just basically, same old select statement. Here we're just selecting the order ID, the order status code from the product order table. Okay, but instead of reading those into some variables, or instead of making this an explicit cursor where we're fetching them into variables, either through a for loop or a basic loop, we're going to bulk collect them into these variables here, in this case, V order IDs and V order status codes. These are um, arrays, the V order IDs and V order status codes. They could be associative arrays, like an index uh, by type of array. Um, or collection, sometimes people call them. It could be a nested table array, it could be a V array, it could be any, any of those three types that you like. Okay, so we have to declare the arrays ahead of time. We do the bulk select. When this select gets done, if it selects a million records, then those, ver those arrays, V order IDs and V order status codes, then they contain a million items in them. Now, the larger your arrays become, then you start running into you know, some lines that, that maybe we shouldn't cross, like these arrays are stored in memory in something called the PGA on the, on the database server. The bigger your arrays are, the more PGA memory you're going to need. So we don't want to get too crazy with this as far as, oh, I have an array with a billion records in it or a billion items in it. I may not have enough room in the, uh, in the PGA for that. But compared to, okay, I'm inside a loop, and inside the loop I hit an SQL, hit an SQL, hit an SQL, hit an SQL. Instead of doing a million context switches, in this case here, I'm only doing one. Okay, not a trick question. Which sounds faster, one context switch or a million context switch to accomplish the same thing? Obviously, one does. So for the select, it's very simple. And for updates, inserts, deletes, and merge, type statements, it's also very simple too. It's going to be a for all statement. This looks like, like a loop, right? It looks like a for loop, but nowhere do you see the word loop in this syntax. Okay, so we say for all, any variable that we want to call it here, we don't have to declare it, in some range. This is like a for loop, some range. You can take advantage of the arrays like V order IDs. It has some what are called methods or functions like first and last or count. So I want to go from the first item in that array to the last item in that array. And what am I going to do? I'm going to do an update statement. So this update will take everything in that array, whatever, whatever arrays I reference in that statement, in this case it's the V order IDs, and it'll go over to the database server in one context switch, and this array is loaded with maybe a million, in this case, order IDs, and he'll do the update over there. Now. There's a lot more that goes into it from there. There's a lot of options we could have in there because out of a million records I'm updating, maybe some of them will fail. And so I, I, can, I can add some other options to this for all. It's kind of beyond what we're going to talk about today to say things like, okay, save, save all the ones that fail in another array. Or I can also say save the ones that succeed in a, a, in a, a third or fourth array. So I can also save the ones that are good, the ones that are bad, and, and I can do with those whatever I want. Maybe I store them in a log table, maybe I write them out to a file, things like that. 
the for all and the update, that's all one statement. So when you do a for all, the only things you can do inside the for all are update, insert, delete, and merge. You cannot do it, and you can't put an if statement. This is all one statement. You can't put an if in there or a case in there. Um, this is all one statement. So you can see big benefits by doing this. Reduce the context switches. What does that mean? Your code runs faster. And people have seen some pretty amazing results. Some of you out there, I'm sure, are already doing that. And you've seen some great results from it, I'm sure. All right, tip five. And here's a real simple one. So like I said, some of these will go real fast. Certain syntax can cause the optimizer not to choose an index. Okay, or, or to, for that matter, to even consider an index. So things like not. So that's this tip here is to avoid not logic. So not equal, um, however you express that. Um, functions that don't have row functions already built for them, just regular B tree functions. Implicit conversions, which is essentially going to be a function. If you do a wildcard search and your wildcard operator, like the percent or the underscores at the front of the string, not after the first character, that could cause that to happen. And any arithmetic operations or things like concatenation can cause him not to consider using an index. Because think about it after all, and those of you who have been in class before, I say this all the time, you think about the index in the back of a reference book. Does it tell you what's not in the book? No. Same thing about the index in the database. So. If you if you have a not in there and you have indexes that are available, you look at your explain plan output and they're not and they're not being used. That's going to be why. Now what you have to do is think of this: Is there another way I could write this query without the not to get the same results? Okay. Tip six. <clears throat> okay, PL SQL pass parameters by reference, not by value necessarily. Okay, by default in a PL SQL program. Um, output parameters and input output parameters are passed by value. Okay, just a regular input parameter, just in all by itself, is going to be passed by reference. Okay, now what does that mean? What if I have some parameters, output parameters that are large arrays? Okay, that could slow us down quite a bit because that's going to take up a lot of memory got to make sure that that array is filled and we pass that array from one program to another. If I make the parameter a pass by reference instead, then I'm just passing a pointer to where that data is stored in memory. Okay, we do that with the no copy option. So if we look at, I'll show you an example here on the next page. All right, so in our parameter list, we have the parameter name, we have the parameter type, and then we can say, is it no copy or not? And then, of course, it's data type. Okay, that'll make it a pass by reference instead. So if you're just passing just scalar values, like a, num a small number or whatever, or a name or something like that, not such a big deal. But if you're passing arrays or records or objects, then you may want to consider using the no copy option on that and pass by reference instead. It can make a big difference. All right, tip number seven, perform joins with the correct join method. Okay, what does that mean? That means we, we're people that we have access to the explain plan utility or somebody else runs it for us and they're explaining it back to us or they provide their results to us. Um, we need to know, in there, in there we typically see things like, oh, my query did a nested loop join, it did a hash join, it did a sort merge join. Okay, is that good or bad when I see a nested loop? Well, we just need to know when is a nested loop um, appropriate, when is a hash join appropriate, when is a sort merge join appropriate. If we look over here on the next page, kind of just some general rules for those, so that when you're looking at your explain plane output, you know what you're kind of looking for here. Nested loops are generally better for small result sets, and we're looking at the optimizer will typically use that based on values, like how big are these result sets, maybe after I do a filter, or maybe before I do a filter, like my where clause. And he's also looking for indexes on the columns that are being joined here, namely the foreign key column and the primary key column, which we know will have a, probably have an index on it. 
but, but the foreign key column won't necessarily have an index on it every time. Okay, so that's where the nest, if you're doing nested, if you're seeing a lot of nested loops and you're looking at the explain plan output and the cardinality that's estimated for those nested loops is in the millions of records or tens of millions, hundreds of millions, your performance can't be very good, even if indexes are being used. The better join method for larger result sets is the hash join. He, he typically will choose the hash join when he does not see an index on the foreign key columns that are being joined. Um, the hash join, he's going to build a hash table based on the fields that we're doing the join on, and he's going to store that in the PGA if possible. Now, if the PGA is not large enough, and we're going to talk about more about the PGA a little bit later on, then he says, well, I could do the hash join and create it, the hash table on disk, but that's not very fast. So if your PGA is too small, that might cause the optimizer to choose a nested loop join, even if he has a lot of data, because he says, I don't need the PGA for the nested loop join. So the PGA, that memory structure where the temporary work is done, is a big factor here. Now, the sort merge join for large result sets is still typically better than a nested loop, but typically not as good as a hash join. Sort merge says I take two objects, maybe two tables, whatever, or two result sets, and I'm joining them on certain columns. I have to do a sort on those columns. So I might have to do two sorts, and that's the downfall of the sort merge. I have to do two sorts a lot of the time, or at least one sort. Uh, rarely do I not have to do a sort on that one, and so that causes a problem. So we, we typically avoid those. But And again, the sorts are done in the PGA, just like the hash tables where they're created. So we just need to know the rules of those different join methods. If we're seeing them show up in our explain plan, which ones are appropriate for what types of joins that are going on as far as the volumes of data go. Okay. All right. Compare uh, performance between alternative syntax of your code. You guys know this, right? But I have to say it. And, and when we teach it in the class, I'll have people write as part of their exercise, okay, here's, here's a problem for you. Now write, come up with four different ways to get the answer. I want people to start thinking about that because I don't, what I don't want you to do is you come up with one way to get the answer and it's slow. And now you just start banging your head, banging your head, banging your head, head, trying to do anything possible to get that piece of code to run fast. You've tried everything. The DBAs have tried everything. It's still slow. Did you try writing it a different way? And, and many of you are very experienced. You'll say, of course we did. Okay? But some people, they have, you know, our brains are fixed a certain way to say some people are join people and some people are subquery people. Some people never think about set operators. So we get into that kind of habit of coding a certain way, which kind of gets in our way of coming up with alternative ways. With that in mind, we can't always say that one way is always better than another way. We can't say that, oh, a non-correlated subquery is always better than a, an outer join or vice versa. You know, sometimes one way is better than another way based on all kinds of factors that are out there. Right, here's an example of that um, on the next page. Here's the problem, and it'll pop up there on the screen here in a second. There you go. Find all the customers that have not placed an order. Okay, we have a customer table that contains all the customers. We have a product order table that contains all orders, period, that, that have been placed by some, some of those customers. So in other words, the customer table has everybody. The product order table only has those customers that have placed an order. I need to know the difference between the two. And I could solve this with what's called an anti-join, which is an outer join where we're doing a search on where something is null. Um, I could do it with a, a non-correlated subquery with a not in. I could do it with a correlated subquery with the exist operator. Or I could use the minus set operator and get the same result. All right, now, you'll, you'll read a lot of places that'll say things like the exist is, is typically faster than a not in or an in, something like that. Um, and a lot of times that's true, but it also depends on a number of things. Like with the exists, it's a, it's a correlated subquery, so we're doing a join between query results. Well, it's going to depend a lot on what's indexed in those two queries. It's just like doing a join at that point. Okay, so just be aware, 
If you can't get one way to work, write it another way. All right, here's a real simple one, and a lot of you, a lot of you do do your coding this way anyway. But you may not may not realize that you're getting an ever so slight performance gain by doing it. Use correlation IDs when performing joins on columns, on the columns that are involved in the query, whether it's required or not. And a lot of you say, well, I always, you know, like in this case here, I'm doing what a one, two, three, four table join. And I've got table aliases or correlation IDs associated with each of those tables. I only need to qualify the columns in the query with those IDs, like E and D and EP and J, if they appear in more than one table, right? So like last name is only in the employee table. I don't have to qualify that. But at the time that this query is parsed, I get an ever so slight performance gain. And I don't know about you, but I'll take anything I can get. If I don't qualify that with an E, here's what the optimizer has to do. Oh, last name, okay, last name. John didn't put an E dot or D dot, no correlation ID on the front of it. So what table's last name in? And he has to go through each of the tables in the from clause. His last name in the employee table. And he has to do a select to do that, a recursive query to do that. Hopefully it's in memory. Oh, last name is in the employee table, great. Okay, but since I didn't specify I want the one from the employee table, now he has to check to the department table to see if it also appears there to see if I have a problem with ambiguous columns here. Is it in the department table, yes or no? No, it's not. Is it in the employee private table, yes or no? No, it's not. Is it in the job table? And the more tables I have, the slower this, the parsing is gonna be. So very simple tip here whether it's required or not, whenever you're doing joins, qualify every column with either the full table name or the correlation ID, or I call them table aliases, whatever you want to do there. All right, again, related to joins, here's the next one, and, and these last ones go pretty quick for you, so hang in there. All right, analyze joins one by one and, and, and check each one to make sure they make sense before you go to the next join. So if you, in other words, if you're doing a six table join, I have people they have problems with six table joins in performance and they're looking at all six tables at once and they're confused. They're like, I don't know what to look at. Well, behind the scenes, no matter how many tables you have, the optimizer is only looking at two things at a time anyway. So we might as well look at two things at a time as well. Okay, go to your explain plane output. Which two things were joined first? What kind of join method was used? Was it nested loop? Was it hash join? Was it sort merge join? Did it, does that make sense for the cardinality, the volume of data we're talking about? If it does, you, you continue on. If it doesn't, then you stop. There's no need to look at the rest right there at that point. Why did he choose a hash join instead of a nested loop join? Maybe the cardinality is off. Maybe the statistics are off. Maybe it's missing an index. Maybe it has an index. It, all kinds of factors there. But the, you can't get your arms around eight or nine or ten tables at once. Just focus on two at a time. All right. Very simple tip there. And a lot of you already do that. But for some of you that are, that are maybe newer to joins and newer to performance tuning, it makes a big deal. All right, let's go to tip 11. This also has to do with joins. You can kind of see a theme here. Eliminate rows as early as possible in the join process or the join order. Think about this. Let's say you're doing a, a four table join and also in your where clause, you're also saying things like where department ID equals 10 and salary is greater than 50,000 and this is true and this is true. What the optimizer has to decide is, do I apply the filters first and get a smaller result set and then do the joins, or do I do the joins first, which will be much larger, and then after I do the joins, throw stuff out? And you might say, well, that sounds ridiculous. You should do the filters first. And that is indeed one of the goals of the optimizer is to do the filters first. But we know while the optimizer is very good that sometimes the optimizer comes up with a bad plan for various reasons. So we want to make sure when we look at the explain plan output, where did he filter the data? Am I doing a join to a, a 10 million row table to a 100 million row table and then I'm throwing stuff out? 
or my throwing stuff out first, which then results in me doing a join between 10,000 rows and 3,000 rows. It's, it's, if you can make the join smaller, then um, your performance is going to be better. All right. A lot of people will look at this slide and say, well, this is a DBA only slide. Um, I don't like to look at it that way. And this has to do with both SQL and PL SQL, um, both. Understand potential bottlenecks in the architecture somewhere, namely in either the database files themselves or in the memory structures that support your code. Okay, I won't go into great detail on all these here, but just be aware. The buffer cache, that's where all your data goes, your data from your tables, your data from your indexes, your, da your change data, your undo data. It's all up in the buffer cache. If it's not sized properly or have too much contention going on in there, um, there's a lot of other factors. Is it being managed automatically or manually by the DBAs? I can have a bottleneck there. The shared pool, that's where your code goes. What about repeated code? Can it take advantage of execution plans that are already in the shared pool or not? What if the shared pool isn't sized properly? And the DBAs typically will do a great job sizing these memory structures, but sometimes it's hard to predict certain transaction things that will happen in the future, whether they be batch jobs or small transactions. We talked about the PGA. That's your temporary work area. That's where sorts are done in memory, hopefully. We'll talk more about the PGA in just a second. And then your redo log buffer, that's where your changes only go. So if you have a system where you're doing a lot of inserts, updates, and deletes, we could have a bottleneck there. And then the redo log files, which are part of the database files, we could have some issues there as well. So just be aware of what these terms are and that they potentially could be bottlenecks causing your code to run slow. If you don't have a good foundation, like a good memory structure foundation, where your data can go, your code can go, your temporary work can be done, um, then your code is in real trouble. We shouldn't really spend a whole lot of time looking at indexes and this and that about your code if the foundation is cracking. So just be aware of those so that you can sit down and talk with the DBAs and everybody is on kind of the same page there. All right, one thing that we need to know is that at the lowest level of the architecture, um, is the block, all right? Your data in a table is stored in blocks. That's the lowest part of the architecture. Uh, the records in your table are stored in blocks. Depending on your record size, you might get one record per block or 1,000 records per block or 10,000 records per block. This is just another tip to, to be aware of. The main goal, the optimizer, is to read the fewest number of blocks possible to get the same result set. So, so when the optimizer looks at it and says, hmm, if I, read an in, if I use an index, it's going to take approximately you know, 50 blocks to get the data I need. If I do a full table scan, it's going to take approximately 10 blocks to read. And he says, oh, reading 10 blocks is better than 50 blocks, so I'm going to choose a full table scan, at least for now. So the, the fewer number of blocks that we can read, the faster our code is going to be. Now, how can I read fewer blocks? Well, sometimes reading an index is fewer blocks than doing a full table scan. Believe it or not, sometimes doing a full table scan is actually fewer blocks than reading an index. What if the blocks were bigger and I could get more records per block? That means I'm reading fewer blocks. Remember, the key here is the number of blocks we're reading not necessarily the number of records we're reading. So if I have bigger blocks, I can get more records per block, and I might be able to then, in that case, I could see a performance benefit from that. Okay, each of these blocks has some options and parameters too. The DBAs are well aware of these, percent free and percent used. Percent free in particular is, is a, a level within the block that saves space in the block for updates to the records that are already in the block. Well, what if this is data that doesn't get updated? It's read-only data. It gets refreshed nightly, total refresh. Maybe I can make my percent free smaller, which means what? Get more records per block. That's my goal. So just, just have it on your list. The whole point of this is this. When you have performance problems, we want a list. We want a list of options. What are the alternatives? The last thing I want is... There's only one thing we can do and only one thing we can do, and it's not a great option, but let's do it. 
what I'd rather have is, okay, here's a big list of how I could improve this query. And in this case here, we might have 20 options in this webinar today. That's what we want. You go through each one. Well, maybe this one's appropriate, maybe it's not. Hey, this one is appropriate, let's check it out. Then go to the next one. Hey, that one worked a little bit better than the previous one. It's much better than only being kind of focused on one thing and only one thing. All right, tip 14. All right, there's some parameters that we need to be aware of. And let me stress this one more time. To me, it does not matter if you're a DBA or a developer or programmer. You need to be aware of these things like the architecture things as well. I want everybody understanding the big picture. There are some parameters. These are parameters that are set at the database level. They can also be changed at the session level. But these parameters all affect and can influence the optimizer one way or another. Okay, optimizer mode, just be aware of what they are for now. Optimizer mode tells the optimizer to come up with a plan based on a certain type of thinking. The DB file multi-block read count, that's that full table scan parameter. That tells the optimizer that if you, if you choose a full table scan, I'm going to let you read multiple blocks in a single I.O. Versus with an index, typically, like an index range scan, you can only read one block at a time. With this, I can read multiple blocks at a time. It's kind of like doing, almost like doing bulk processing. And then the index, optimizer index caching and optimizer cost adjustment, those have to do with what can I expect from my indexes. The index caching means if you choose an index optimizer, um, the higher this number is, the more likely that you'll find it in memory. Because what if that number is real low and the optimizer is saying, hmm, hmm, Bill, um, should I use an index or should I do a full table scan? Well, this parameter here says that my chances of finding the index in the buffer cache in memory is very slim. So maybe I should just read the entire table. These all influence the optimizer when he chooses a certain execution plan. And then same thing on the optimizer cost adjustment. By default, it, it says that index access and full table scan access cost the same. That's like going to the store and you're trying to choose between a red apple and a green apple, but they co both cost 50 cents. Which ones do you choose? Well, cost does not become a factor in your decision. But what if the red apple is 20 cents and the green apple is 80 cents? Then cost might be a factor in which one you choose. So with this one, if we lower the cost adjustment from its default value, which is a 100, if we lower that, that says indexes cost less than full table scans. In other words, indexes are on sale. And who doesn't like a sale? I do. So just be aware that these parameters can influence the optimizer to come up with different execution plans, and in some cases, a bad execution plan. All right, 15. We're, we're running downhill here. We're almost done, so hang with me. I'm sorry about going over a little bit here. When creating a multi-column index, make sure you put them in the right order. Many of you already know that. Bottom line here is what? For just regular B tree index access that we're trying to um, tune, we want the most selective column first. Okay, what, what columns do we see in our where clause a lot, but is it also the most selective out of all the columns we're putting in our index? You know, primary key columns are very selective, right? Other columns might not be. Many of you may have heard of the skip scan feature with indexes. It wants the opposite of that. It wants the least selective or the less selective columns first. So if you're building all your columns based on the rule, and this is a very common rule, to put the most selective columns first, you're probably not seeing a whole lot of skip scan access methods going on. Skip scan says I have an index built on, let's say, these three columns, one, two, three, but your query only accesses um, columns two and three, not the leading column of the index. All right. If that leading column happens to be uh, non-selective or le very less selective compared to the others, then it is possible that Oracle could still use the index even though you don't reference the leading column, but only in the, if it's a really selective column, he's not ever going to do that. Okay, so 15 is build your indexes with the most selective column first. 16, 
Avoid unnecessary sorts. Okay, we know that. We need to know what, what causes sorts. Order buys, the sinks, group buys, unions, intersects, minus, hash joins, sort merge joins. If you create an index, whether it's non-unique or unique, you get a, it has to do uh, temporary work. It has to do a sort. Generating statistics on objects. Okay, all that work is done in the PGA. Okay, a little bit about the PGA here before we wrap up. That's where all your temporary work is done. We want all that temporary work to be done in memory if possible. If not, it goes to the temporary table space or a temporary table space, okay, which means disk, physical reads. That slows us down. Also be aware of this. By default, an individual process cannot consume the entire PGA. There's an undocumented parameter called un underscore PGA max size. It says that each individual process can only take up a certain amount of the PGA at one time. That way, nobody can hog the whole thing. Okay. So if you add an order by, it might get slower. You add it, you, you change something, and now he's doing a hash join instead of a nested loop. It might might actually get slower because he's trying to do it in the PGA and there's not enough room in the PGA or too much contention in the PGA. Maybe he's having to go to disk. Last three here. Do not overuse selects. This says select from dual, but really any SQL in your PL SQL programs when you don't have to. Remember, that's a context switch. I see people do this all the time, and they may even have it inside a loop where they're doing a, something like a select sysdate into a variable from dual. Well, rather than doing that, how about we do this? V date colon equals sysdate. There's no SQL in that, that assignment operation there. We say, well, sysdate's an SQL function, but SQL functions are optimized differently than an SQL statement. So this do will be faster than the select because it doesn't have to do a context switch. And the more often that you do, you, you can avoid that, the bigger benefits you'll get. Okay, another thing is if you're using sequences in there, we say here, instead of doing select sequence name dot next val to get the next value of a sequence from dual, you can just assign the next value of the sequence to a variable. Again, avoiding the context switch. We need to, as we're writing our code, we need to ask ourselves, oh, anytime you put an SQL statement in your PL SQL program, you should ask yourself, is there another way I could write this and avoid doing SQL altogether inside my PL SQL program? That's your tip. All right, and then some very kind of general ones here at the end. All right, SQL and PL SQL. I, every class, I ask people this question. Do you have, in your environment, in your organization, in your company, do you have SQL and PL SQL standard documents that everybody's supposed to follow, that are enforced by somebody, that are checked by somebody? Do you have code reviews to make sure everybody's following these? Because as many of you know, like for in PL SQL, there's three different ways to do loops, for loop, while loop, basic loop. Which one should we do? Do I do if then else, if then else if? Do I do a simple case? Do I assert, do a search case? What do I make in uppercase? What do I put in lowercase, whether it's SQL or not? Do I put code on one line or multiple lines? Does it matter for performance? Sometimes it does. A lot of times it'll make it more readable, more understandable, but sometimes indirectly you could get a performance gain out of that. So if you're not aware of in your environment, do you have standards that you should be following, ask somebody when you go back to your desk today. All right, if you haven't seen them before, but you know they're there, today's a perfect day to go out and find them and read them and see what's in there. A lot of times people will say, well, we have standards, but nobody enforces them. Sometimes people will say, well, we all have our own individual standards. That means you don't have any, right? Because <laughs> everybody's standard might be different. It can matter. All right, last two, thank you for hanging in there. Take advantage of available tuning tools. Has anybody used the tuning advisor? 
are you licensed for it or not? It's part of the, either the tuning pack or the diagnostic pack. Most large corporations are licensed for it. SQL Tuning Advisor, you give them your code, the Tuning Advisor looks at it and comes up with, here's what I found, here's what I recommend, here's the rationale behind my recommendation, and oh, by the way, there might be some, here's some code if you decide to implement my recommendation. It's just like another person you might go to and say, hey, hey, Dave, what do you think of this code? Except now we're going to the tuning advisor for that. Okay, so if you haven't seen some of these before, you might want to take advantage of them. They're going to help in tuning a lot. Every one of these I find beneficial and useful, whether you're a DBA or a developer. If you don't have the privilege to run it, you ask the DBA to run it. I work as a DBA most of the time. I have no problem with that. You come to me and say, hey, John, this query's giving me fits. I've tried this. I've tried that. I've ran it through explain plan. I've checked the indexes. I've checked the statistics. Everything looks good. I'm not sure what's going on. Can we run it through the tuning advisor and see what it thinks, or what do you think? Okay, PL SQL Profiler. There's a package for that. Do you have the privileges to execute the programs in that package? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It'll tell you. Which, which statements within your PL SQL program executed the most, which ones consumed the most time. So if your PL SQL program took four hours to run, what part of that program consumed most of that four hours? Was it one statement? Was it several statements? Was it just accumulated over the, the entire program? So it's kind of hard to tell. But if it was only one statement, oh, this one statement took three and a half out of the four hours. The rest of the program ran pretty quickly. Now I can focus on that one statement and tune it. And then most people are familiar with explain plan, auto trace, and then you get into the, the tracing events that are available in Oracle, like the uh, 10046, which then we can see it's kind of information that's very similar to explain plan and auto trace kind of combined. The 10053 is kind of interesting. It'll tell you um, okay, I pass a statement to the optimizer, and if you run explain plan, it says, oh, here's the plan I chose, or here's the plan I think I would choose if I were to run your statement. What the 10053 tells you is, not only here's the plan I chose, but here's the key part, here's all the other, pro all the other plans that I considered. So if you're looking at the plan he chose, and you're like, oh, that's a bad plan, why did he choose that? I can't believe it. You can look in that 10053 trace and see, oh, I see he considered this plan here, which I think would be better, and here's why he rejected it for whatever reason. And you can see all the other plans. There might be 100 plans in there that he considered. So take advantage of those other tuning tools. Whether you have the privileges or not, be aware they're there, so you can ask other people that do have the privileges to run them for you or if they have already run them. And lastly... I made this last on purpose, hints. A lot of discussion, a lot of debate about how hints should be used. Okay, I, I view hints as a temporary solution, as a last result solution. I know there's some of you out there that use hints, boom, right away. My query doesn't run. He did not use an index. I'm going to slap an index hint on there. Okay, Th There are better permanent solutions than a hint available. Why did he not use your index? Is it because of your code? Is it because of the statistics? Is it because of a parameter setting? Is it because of a memory structure size that's bad? There's all kinds of things that could cause them not to choose an index. Now, you could use that hint, index hint right now so that hopefully he would use it, although there's no guarantee, hopefully he will use it, and that buys you some time while you try to what? Diagnose the true problem and a more permanent solution. So it's okay for that. All right. Wow, we talked about a lot of stuff there, didn't we? Anything from simple things like uh, putting aliases on your column names when you do joins to more complex things like taking advantage of extended statistics or the result cache. We saw all kinds, and this is just 20. Uh, we could come up with 50 or 100 if we sat down and did this. Some would be very simple. Some would be more complex. There are a lot of them out there for sure. All right. We talk about many of the other things and many of the other full classes that we have. You know, the SQL optimization class, for example, is three days long. You know, today we, we had an hour. So imagine what we could talk about in three days 
not only about these 20, but actually trying these 20 and trying, you know, 40 other ones as well. So lots of classes out there available for you to, to take advantage of as well. If you just go to themasinc.com, you can see a list of those classes out there. Um, John Cacavell is a great person you can get a hold of. There's his email address. Um, remember, my email address, too, was jmullins at themasinc.com. If you want a copy of the slides, they're already out there at themasinc.com slash webinars. Um, and like I said, in a day or so, that the full presentation recording of this presentation will be out there as well. Now, if you go out to the slash webinars, you're going to find all kinds of other webinars out there if you've never been out there before. There's other Oracle ones out there. There's DB2 ones out there. There's Java ones out there. There's all kinds of webinars out there. So take advantage of those. Those webinars are free, and if you decide you want more information, more detailed stuff, then you could certainly sign up for a class or request a class as well. Okay. All right. I appreciate everybody coming today. I appreciate you sticking around to the very end, too. I'm very sorry that I went over. Um, as you guys know from class, I tend to do that a little bit. But hopefully some of those topics there will, will give you some kind of fuel for thought. Uh, hopefully you took some good notes. If not, um, go out and get a copy of the slides. If you have any questions down the road, send me an email at jmullins at themasync.com. All right, thank you everybody for attending. Hopefully you'll have a great end to your week and a good weekend that's coming up. And hopefully I'll see you again in a future webinar. We do have another webinar coming up on April 27th for the DB2 folks out there that David Simpson's been doing. It'll be part three of running SQL in the uh, 21st century there. So you can certainly come out and, and take a look at that. It's part three of a series he's been doing already. All right, thanks everybody. Hopefully I'll talk to you again soon. Have a great day.